is Ukraine finally going to be getting some main battle tanks? And what's Russia going to do about it? Are they turning to shaving? to take care of it. I'm Paul, U.S. Army combat veteran. It is January 23rd, 2023. This is your daily Ukraine update. Let's get right into it. Okay, first off, when we look at the control map, the biggest change is, of course, advances uh, broadly outside of Solidar. You guys can see that it looks like Russia is continuing its goal to push to the northwest of Solidar, um, taking the majority of this small town of Krasnopovlivka. Um, Again, as we've talked about, it, it, what they're doing is forming a sort of salient here. And I am not sure what exactly uh, they're using as a boundary. They might be using this small river here. The, it looks like the Batmutka River. Um, and that maybe we're seeing Ukraine like perform a sort of controlled retreat. The thing that we always talk about is salience in this war don't last long, and Russia seems to be deliberately creating one. There's not really a larger encirclement that's going that's at work here. And so this is why I'm sort of curious as to why Russia continues to advance in this corner, especially given that there's not really a significant direction here of of real value um they may aspire to try to complete an encirclement uh by pushing out from maybe somewhere like zolotarivka but that would mean opening an entire other axis of advance when they're already driving in bakhmut driving in solidar and driving in donetsk uh honestly what's puzzling too is that you guys can see here um the you or russian forces were also kind of sort of starting to affect an encirclement near avdivka but as you guys can see they're kind of blocked along this roadway again a natural barrier or a natural barrier you know it's a road but this is probably their best bet to encircle an urban area of some significance and yet they're like pushing into Solidar. It's really puzzling behavior given that it seems to just be continuously opening them up to attacks now from two sides. It's going to be harder and harder to make those advances. When we look over to the combat map, you guys can see like we talked about, uh, there remains a limited amount of combat taking place in this region here. This seems like much lighter based on reports. Uh, but what you have instead is, as we talked about, efforts to push northwest in Solidar, and uh, it looks like they're trying to also push north here in this Belohorivka region. So I suspect that they realize that if they need to push outward in Solidar, they need to bring up this line as well to create um, some sort of coherent front line. And, and this is a tall order. Again, as you guys can see, Russian troops are spread very thin. They're continuing to push in Donetsk, despite it creating minimal gains. They're continuing to attack in Bakhmut, and they're trying to uh, push in Solidar. And even where they're having success, it's not clear that they can fully uh, take advantage of that success. Um, when we look at War Mapper, of course, War Mapper is reporting no changes to the front line in the last 24 hours. Um, no changes to the Bakhmut front either. Uh, but what's most interesting, at least to me, is first off, it reports that Poland is asking Germany for the go-ahead to send tanks to Ukraine. Poland is uh, uses as their main battle tank the Leopard 2, a German-made tank. And like similar to the United States' rules, where when we provide allies with U.S.-made military equipment, there are strings attached, right? The allies cannot resell it. They have to ensure that the technology is safeguarded appropriately. And this is simply to avoid uh, U.S. military technology falling into the hands of adversaries. Well, Germany, of course, is going to have similar rules. And <clears throat> It sounds like Poland is really looking hard at taking, at getting permission to send their German Leopard tanks uh, to Ukraine. Uh, this is what's interesting is that the Leopard is supposedly a somewhat lighter tank uh, than the Abrams or I believe the Challenger, meaning that it's more likely to be able to traverse many of the bridges um, and uh, muddy, more poorly developed roads in Ukraine. So it may actually in some ways be a better choice for a modern main battle tank than the Abrams. Um, 
But, uh, you know, Poland has said they are asking Germany for permission, but it's of secondary importance. And um, that they plan actually on sending their tanks interesting, even without German permission. So this is some diplomatic uh, wrangling in which you want you to do your best, right? Why would you needlessly antagonize a person who's a, an ally and a major supplier of your military equipment? Uh, Germany, right? So Poland's trying to do the diplomatic thing and get permission, even though it acknowledges that uh, it maintains that it doesn't need it. But this itself may be wrangling because the there's some reports that Germany has already said they don't plan on stand on standing in the way of getting these major armored vehicles to Ukraine. And as we've talked about, um, you know, it's not a ton, 350 active leopards and another 200 in storage. Uh, Ukrainian government says that tanks, especially German made leopards are vital if it wants to uh, push back against the Kremlin's forces. And it's probably uh, true because when we, again, look at the map, you guys can see that tanks thrive in environments, especially in large parts of Ukraine. Open terrain um, with lots and lots of avenues of advance is a excellent, excellent place uh, for tank and mechanized warfare. You saw also, you know, we've talked about the fact that Russia's all-out offensive here is advancing at uh, dozens of meters a day. This looks like about maybe maybe 500 meters, if that, at the furthest advance. Um, whereas a tank, uh, when you achieve a breakthrough with mechanized forces, you can achieve things some, like this Kharkiv offensive, where in a matter of just a couple days, these forces were able to push deep into Russian territory and um, move so fast that Russia was unable to effectively react to the constantly changing situation on the ground. So with mechanized forces, um, you can achieve a breakthrough and then push uh, hundreds of meters or hundreds of uh, you know kilometers potentially in just a few days. Um, and so that is one of the biggest reasons why they're so sought after. Also, because a lot of a lot, but not all of Russia's advanced anti-armor uh, forces and equipment have been expended in a lot of ways. Uh, it's going to be much harder for them to take on uh, top tier main battle tanks, right? Early in the war, of course, you saw Russia and Ukraine uh, clashing using their most advanced equipment in a lot of cases and their best anti-tank and anti-air weapons. Now, of course, you're starting to see that change as Russia has to reach deeper into its Soviet era stores. Um, and, you know, Ukraine also has had a lot of its previous uh, limited mechanized forces that it has um, or had have you know taken a lot of damage been attrited um and have been replaced largely with captured it appears with captured russian equipment so that has the potential to really change the game if you can get mechanized forces in to ukrainian hands well that's but Russia also has its own plans up its sleeve. Uh, Russia's new general, uh, some reports indicate, is fixated on professionalizing the military, which sounds good, but professionalizing a military in the middle of a war is like trying to build an airplane um, from parts after already had a, after, you know, trying to sew a parachute after you've jumped out of the plane. It's a little late in the game. And it also is just sort of bizarre. He's focusing on soldier discipline, which, as we've talked about in other videos, is a tremendous, tremendous weakness of the Russian military. If you've been a member of the Patreon, you guys know we looked at a lot of videos in the past two weeks of Russian troops exhibiting a, a very, very low level of discipline under fire and a low level of discipline um, in the uh combat environment generally and it reflects probably first and foremost the lack of training but also the lack of quality recruits again smart soldiers sorry smart civilians know to get out or get a doctor's exemption or something to get out of conscription 
the people who are unsophisticated, uh, unsure of how to navigate bureaucracies, um, they're the ones who are going to get roped into mobilization. So they're already probably not super well uh, mentally. They lack the the basic discipline as civilians, and so they're not really ready to uh, internalize the high level of discipline required of, of troops, of combat troops. Um, so they're not wrong. Uh, he's not wrong, but in a classic general move, um, they've decided. He's decided that getting troops to shave more often is a one way to instill discipline. Um, clamping down on non-regulation uniform, traveling in civilian vehicles, use of mobile phone, and non-standard haircuts. This is maybe the dumbest take I've ever seen. Uh, non-regulation uniform many of the people wear non-regulation uniform because as we've seen russian troops are not equipped for the winter and so they have to adopt civilian gear or captured ukrainian gear in an effort to just have serviceable uniforms i mean i can tell you i was a u.s soldier and i in afghanistan and i oftentimes ran out of serviceable uniforms i one time went three weeks wearing just one pair of pants um, that eventually had a hole torn in the crotch and i just sort of held it together with duct tape because they were very specific about you know you had to have um flame uh, uh flame retardant pants and uh that was i only has down to one pair so if you're a russian soldier um just having serviceable uniforms that are weather appropriate is probably a struggle you know travel in civilian vehicles uh again if you lack mechanization you're going to have to use civilian vehicles um use of mobile phones as we've seen there's a real shortage of radios among Russian troops, so mobile phones are a natural alternative and non-standard haircuts. Again, if you can't get food to the front lines, you really think you're going to get a barber? This is the kind of thing, this is the kind of out-of-touch generalship that, don't get me wrong, the United States military does in spades. The number of dumb, out-of-touch generals who believe these things are essential to winning some sort of war uh, is absolutely eye-watering. Uh, and they really just fail to understand that not every troop is as well taken care of, cared for as a general officer. Um, but the fact that they don't even seem to understand that providing uniforms um, providing proper armored vehicles, providing basic communication tools, um, and having a sufficient and living conditions satisfactory enough to implement haircuts. These are these are things that need to be focused on, but on the back end. And for some reason, shaving has become a a fix it, a real focus. I'm here to tell you that if you can't properly clean your body, shaving is just another way for bacteria to enter your face. Uh, you cut yourself shaving, you nick yourself. Also, if you can't get clean potable water, then what are you going to use? You're gonna have to dry shave. It's gonna irritate your skin and again increase the risk of infection. Um, this is something that uh, again. If he spent any time, he doesn't even have to be on the front lines. He just has to watch a couple of videos from the front lines and understand that this is the case. But it's even worse because the shaving, remember, unlike a lot of Western countries, a large portion of Russian Russia's military force are the Kadyrov, Kadyrovitsky. And these are Chechen Muslims who, as you may recall, as part of their, as a deeply ingrained part of their culture and religion, uh, men are expected to wear facial hair. It's considered insulting and uh, 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 infantilizing to expect them to shave, be go clean shaven. So, and uh, supposedly Orthodox Christians, um, another large religious contingent within the Russian uh, military, also believe that adult men should uh, sh are supposed to carry a beard, wear a beard. So again, just. He doesn't even appear to understand who he has in his command and what it means to impose these regulations on their troops. Um, 
even the DNR uh, called this a farce that would hamper the process of destroying the enemy. Uh, Prigozhin said, war is the time of the active and courageous, not the clean shaven. Uh, so this dude is just being dunked on right and left. He's This guy was a longtime chief of general staff of Russia's armed forces, uh, meaning that he was a protocol and scheduler for many years. Uh yeah, and he apparently was one of the people who uh, came up with Russia's invasion plan in the first place. So almost certainly his ability to assess the Russian armed forces uh, should be treated with a healthy degree of skepticism. Anyway, guys, that's all I had for you. Thanks, as always, for joining me. Of course, if you want to check out those combat video breakdowns, the kind that, that are just too intense for YouTube, you know the viral ones I'm talking about. I break all those down on the Patreon. Uh, thanks so much to my Lieutenant Tier patrons. You guys are the ones who make this whole thing possible. I'll see all you guys in the next one.